following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We are gathered for this lecture today on Saturday the 13th. And Saturday the 13th marks a We're gathered for this lecture today on Saturday the 13th, which is a special day for students of the Gnostic tradition because of its symbolic significance. The word Saturday comes from the word Saturn, which of course is the name of a Greek god. Saturn is the god of time, the god of endings, the god of death. And in the structure of the esoteric stellar studies of astronomy or astrology, Saturn is the seventh of the seven. He is the god of endings. So where the moon is the first and begins and conceives and originates, Saturn closes, ends, and prepares for the new beginning. And that's why we have this tradition nowadays that is close to forgotten of at the new year, we have the old man time of the old year depicted as an old man with a beard, and we have the young baby who's bringing in the new year. Those symbols come from the esoteric tradition of the moon and Saturn. The moon which initiates its conception, it's the newness, it's the coming of a new age. And the old man which represents the passing away of that which was. Saturday is the day of Saturn. The day in which we remember and reflect on the week on the time that has just passed. Moreover, today is Saturday the 13th, and 13 also has special significance because it is the number or the letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Mem. Mem represents the waters, but it also represents change, death, a great transformation. And this is why we find the letter Mem in very important words throughout the tradition of Kabbalah, such as Malkut, such as Mavep, which means death. So Saturday the 13th, students of Gnosis perform a special exercise in recognition of these symbols, in which at the 13th hour, which is one o'clock, the Gnostic student enters into a practice of meditation, 
lying down in the form of a pentagonal star, a pentagram, with the arms and legs spread like a star. In order to pray and to invoke and to beg the assistance of Melchizedek, this word Melchizedek has central importance in the Jewish and Christian traditions and should have importance for everyone on this planet. The word Melchizedek appears throughout the Jewish and Christian scriptures, but is a very poorly understood symbol and person. As we've explained in many lectures and throughout the books of Samael and Beor, the prophets and apostles are both real people and symbols of factors or elements or archetypes within us. Melchizedek is no exception. Melchizedek is particularly important because of his true identity. Something that has been controversial in religions for thousands of years and is still unresolved because the traditions nowadays have lost the esoteric heart. They no longer know the roots of their own tradition. Those roots are in Melchizedek. If you study Christianity, if you come from a Christian background, you probably have the assumption that the unction, the Eucharist, the sacrifice of bread and wine, was originated by Jesus Christ. But this would be wrong. If you study the Bible, you'll find that the one who originated, who began, who first showed humanity the use of bread and wine, is Melchizedek. All the way back in the book of Genesis. Moreover, it says in that passage that Melchizedek was a high priest who blessed Abram. Now, we know today that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all consider Abram, or Abraham, to be their great patriarch, to be the father of these religions. And yet, he bowed before Melchizedek. He asked for the blessings of Melchizedek. So Abram, Abraham, was below Melchizedek. This is very significant. It shows to us that much of what we have inherited is not accurate in terms of our theories and beliefs and ideas about our religions. Amongst the Jewish tradition, there has been a, a bit of disquiet for thousands of years because it's stated in that tradition that, that the priesthood, the Kohen, originated with Aaron and that he was the father or the, the originator of the priesthood amongst the Jewish tradition, when in fact... Aaron comes after Melchizedek. Melchizedek appeared far before Aaron, and Melchizedek is described as a high priest. So many rabbis have struggled with this to explain how it is that Aaron supposedly is the originator of the priesthood when in fact Melchizedek was there long before. What this tells us is that what the traditional religious authorities theorize about the origins of their religions is wrong. What we find in truth, even in the scriptures themselves, is that all religions are much older than we think, and they originate from a place about which we've forgotten. Religions have a primeval root that's far more ancient than our memory. The primeval root of all of our religions is much older than any of our written scriptures. It's much older than any of our theories. It's much older than any artifact on this planet. To find the root of those religions is no simple task. But we have a great hint, a great clue. And it's in the Bible. Melchizedek. 
Melchizedek was there to bless Abram, who later originated these great traditions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Melchizedek was already a high priest. And we already explained a lot about Melchizedek in the course, The Sacraments of the Gnostic Church. You can study about Melchizedek and about the unction that he originated in that course. It's covered in detail. What's important for us to understand now is not the person, the man, the master, Melchizedek, but the symbol, what he represents and what he's related to. You see, Melchizedek is an archetype. Just like Moses, Jesus, Abraham, Muhammad, they are archetypes who represent psychological and spiritual values within us that we have to develop. The name Melchizedek is actually a title, just like Yeshua Christos is a title, and Buddha Shakyamuni is a title. These are not names like personal names. They are honorific terms that describe a quality or a level of attainment. The name Melchizedek is, of course, Hebrew. The first part of that name is Melech, and that means king, a ruler. And the second part, Tzedek, it's Sadiq. We've given lectures about the Sadikim, the Sadiq, who are the righteous ones. And thus the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. King of justice. King of the law. Melchizedek represents a great archetype, a spiritual, psychological archetype related with justice, righteousness, the law. Not as a form of punishment, but as a form of elevated principle, a form of beauty that reflects the beauty of the law that reflects the purity of Christ. What's interesting about him as a symbol is that even in the New Testament, Jesus became a high priest after the word of Melchizedek. In other words, Jesus, who we know is a great savior, a great avatar, a great master, attained that under the guidance, under the leadership under the authority of Melchizedek. This is a very shocking thing that the modern Christians find scandalous and try to explain away with lots of theories, saying that Melchizedek and Jesus are the same one, etc. But the fact is, Melchizedek is an archetype, a principle, related with Christ, related with the superior aspects of nature, the law itself. In other words, what we can call karma, cause and effect. The basic fundamental principle upon which existence depends. Cause and effect. Melchizedek represents that, but as one who has perfected it, who lives and acts and breathes in harmony with the law. And the name Melchizedek begins with Mem, the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which, as I mentioned, relates with water and death. And if you've studied the arcana of the Tarot, you know that the 13th arcanum is immortality or death. Great change is represented in this image. And the 13th Arcanum depicts a reaper standing on the earth with his threshing tool, his scythe, in order to slice down the wheat, the plants. And from that process of the plants dying, from their death emerges new life, new flowers. 
And this is the great fundamental axis of nature. Life and death. The moon and Saturn. What we can see then, even in the very shape of the letter Mem, is a great cycle. Life and death. The number 13 represents that. This is normal function of nature. Life and death. This planet is sustained upon this principle of life and death. It is an inescapable law. It is the law throughout all the levels of nature that whatever is born must also die. We don't comprehend that. We do not have cognizance of this fact. Because we persist in the notion that somehow we can cheat death. Somehow we can escape it. Somehow we can manage to fulfill our desires and avoid death. And we are very persistent in our avoidance of death and the topic of death at least as far as it's concerned with ourselves and our interests. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the Arcanum 13, the letter Mem, represents this fundamental principle of nature. And that's why it's the first letter of the name Melchizedek. As the king of righteousness, the king of justice, he is a lord of death, related with Saturn. This has specific importance for us, and this is why on the 13th, any Saturday the 13th, the Gnostics perform this exercise to meditate and to entreat Melchizedek for assistance. And there's a specific reason why we do this exercise. Melchizedek, as I mentioned, is a great master someone who's very mysterious, but oddly should not be. Because the, the, as we've described to you in other lectures, every great master, very high masters, reach a level called Logos, or Cosmo Creator. They transcend the level of the intellectual animal or even the regular human being and become supermen, or Logos. What this means is that that master, that entity, has become a cosmo-creator, has transcended the limitations of a mere humanoid body, and is now capable of originating new levels of physical bodies. Every star, every planet, every solar system is the body of a master. When we look at the heavens, we see the celestial traffic we're seeing the bodies of very elevated conscious beings who, within their organism, sustain the lives of billions of others. And that is how they manifest the law of Christ, which is sacrifice. They give of themselves in order to aid others to rise also. All of the planets, all of the suns, all of the systems are conscious. We already know from mere terrestrial physics that light has consciousness, that light makes choices. But light is only an expression of a sun, of a star. It is the light of Christ expressing itself out from the body of that master. You see, our sun, Ors, the center of our solar system, is the body of Michael, a great angel. And you see his resplendent nature and the solar light that emerges from him, from his heart. And likewise with every planet in our system. Mars is the body of Samael, the Logos. Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Venus, all of these planets are the bodies of angels, the bodies of masters. Earth is no exception. This body of Earth 
is not inert matter. It is not just an aggregation of rocks. It is a living, breathing organism. It is alive. We only have life because the earth lives. If the earth dies, we die. Let us look at the moon. We have this mistaken notion that the moon is younger than the earth. But tests have shown that the samples that come from the moon are much older than the earth. And the scientists have been scrambling for years to understand why. But the natives, the indigenous peoples, the traditional cultures have known. They call the moon the mother of the earth. They call the moon our grandmother. This is a very significant statement. Here we see and visualize our planet Earth. And upon it are all these billions of humanoids. And floating in space is the moon. If the moon is the grandmother of us, the mother of the Earth, Melchizedek is then our mother who is nourishing the birth of new earths, which is us. This is why in all the ancient traditions, there's always discussion of the philosophical earth. Aretz in Hebrew. What is that? It is you. It is me. The ancient occult axiom states, as above, so below. What we know of as the physical earth is the macrocosm, that which is above, that which we come from. We emerge from that. We are the microcosm, the small earth. And this is why in Kabbalah, Malkut, which is the lowest sephira on the tree, represents earth, physicality. Not only the physical earth and all the kingdoms on the planet, which is what the word Malkut means, kingdom, but our own earth, our kingdom, our body, not only physical, but psychological and spiritual. This is our Adam. Our earth. So you see, the moon was once a world like our Earth. It was called Selene. It was once a living place. It was once the home of a great humanity in a past age, in a past cosmic round. But that humanity unfortunately Degenerated. They fell victim to desire. They did not have the capability, the capacity to transform themselves and to rise up. And they died. And their planet died. And that's what we see in our heavens now a dead world lifeless, a corpse, a bone. Have you ever seen a bone? It is pale, it is dry, it is dead. That is the moon. It is a skeleton in the sky. When that world died, its essence, its core attributes, gave rise to a new world, our planet Earth. This, of course, occurred over countless eons, a time span that would be inconceivable to us. But that new Earth, our planet, went also through its many ages, many races, many times of development, many civilizations. We are not the only one. We are one in a long chain. 
But unfortunately, we also are degenerating like the Selenites did. We also are not conquering desire. We're not able to sacrifice and rise up. Instead, we're sinking into the mud. The evidence is abundant. It's everywhere. What do we see on our planet related with virtue, related with qualities of spirit? We don't see a civilization that is improving, that is rising towards the light. We see a civilization that is trembling, that is shuddering in pain. What we need to observe here is a very intimate relationship between the humanoid creatures on the surface of the world and the world that they inhabit. The macrocosm and the microcosm are intimately related. You see, nature is in us as much as we are in nature. We don't like that. Somehow, inexplicably, we now have come to a stage in our civilization where we want to be divorced from nature. We scarcely touch nature anymore. We walk on artificial surfaces. We clothe and cover our bodies with artificial <coughs> coverings. We scarcely touch the dirt, the soil, the grass. We scarcely see the sky. We've become divorced from our mother. And somehow we think we are separate from nature. That somehow we are masters and kings and queens of nature. When the evidence is clearly opposite. We are just victims of circumstances. We have no control. Not only of ourselves, but of nature around us. We are very weak even though we believe we are the most elevated civilization ever. The evidence is the opposite. Let us observe this civilization. What does it have to offer? Perpetual war? Increasing poverty and slavery? A rapid decline in the availability of pure water and real food? Nowadays, you can't go to any market and buy an actual tomato. You cannot. You go to any market, the fruit has been mixed with animal hormones. It is not a fruit. It is not a vegetable. It is a hybrid. It is a graft. It is an abomination. What about the rest of our food supply? The world depends on several primary crops. Wheat, corn, soy, rice. None of these crops are the same crops that our grandparents ate. Not one of them. Every one of them now has been patented by a corporation. Every one of them now is no longer a diversity of seeds, a diversity of uh, fruits or vegetables or grains. Most of the world's wheat crop, corn crop, soy, and rice come from one root, which has been modified by scientists. Which means that one crop, which is now worldwide, it only takes one disease to kill it. In the past, we had a great diversity of wheat varieties, corn varieties, soy varieties, and a disease could come and maybe wipe out a few crops in a few areas, and it'd be a, a minor famine. But no longer is this the case. Now a farmer cannot grow the crop that they choose. They have to get permission, and they have to pay a fee to the corporation that owns the patent. You might think I'm making this up, but I'm not. And this is a f the factor that's happening not only in North America, but it's spreading around the world. And those crops, genetically modified, scientifically engineered, are vulnerable. Right now, there is a, a uh, rust, a wheat rust that's spreading up from Africa into the Middle East. 
that the scientists are not able to control. And within a few years, it will probably produce a famine. And it could spread worldwide, and there's no antidote. It's killing the crop that they engineered. This danger is not just one crop. It's every one of these crops, all of them. All of our fruits, all of our vegetables are in danger of this type of situation. This is why the scriptures predict famines. The spread of starvation. What about our water? We can't go to this river and drink that water. We can't find a stream that we can drink from. Almost anywhere. Even in third world countries. Even in the countryside. Even in the mountains. The waters are impure. On the whole planet. We now have the worst water supply in our history. What about our air? It's impure. Everywhere in the world. Air is not isolated to one place. It moves around the planet. And it's carrying with it all kinds of impurities and pollutants and radioactive materials all over the planet. What about inside the earth? What about the earth itself? The soils everywhere are being depleted. Now, in order to grow crops in most places in the world, you have to pump the ground with chemicals. Otherwise, the crops, the earth cannot sustain growth. They've been depleted. They've been poisoned. And so these companies now have to pump enormous amounts of chemicals and fertilizers in order to grow anything. Our oceans are dying. The forests are dying. The earth is trembling. All of us are aware in recent days of a surge of earthquakes. And many people are afraid. Many people are dying. If you study the records that the scientists are keeping, you see a major earthquake every couple of days with increasing frequency. We see that in the 1990s, we averaged 50 to 60 major earthquakes a year. And by 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 9, we're over 1,000 a year. I have the data here if anybody wants to see it. It's not made up. Why is this? Let me ask you a question. If you were to see a person covered with disease, sick, dying, shaking with convulsions, what would you think would happen to him? What would you assume is going to happen? You would assume he's going to die. That's what's happening to our planet. Our planet is dying. No one wants to admit it, but the evidence is abundant. And let me read to you something said by Melchizedek himself about his body, this planet Earth. Melchizedek gave this prophecy in Tibet. I suggest you prepare yourself because it's not easy to hear. He said, men will gradually forget their souls to only take care of their bodies. The greatest corruption will reign on earth. Men will resemble ferocious beasts, thirsty for their brother's blood. The half moon will darken and its adepts will fall in perpetual war. The greatest misfortunes will fall upon them and they will fight each other. The crowns of the kings, great and small, will fall. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
a terrible war among all peoples will break out. The oceans will roar. The earth and the bottoms of the seas will be covered in bones. Kingdoms will disappear. Entire populations will die. Famine, disease, crimes not covered by the laws, never seen, never dreamed of by men. Then the enemies of God and divine spirit that lie in man himself will come. Those who raise their hands against others will perish as well. The forgotten and the persecuted will rise later. They will be the center of attention of the whole world. There will be thick darkness, horrible storms. Mountains until then arid will be covered with forests. Earth will be shaken. Millions of men will exchange the chains of slavery and humiliations for hunger, pestilence, and death. The roads will be crowded with people walking randomly from one place to another. The greatest, most beautiful cities will disappear in fire. One, two, three. Out of 10,000 men, one will survive. And he will be naked, deprived of reason, and lacking strength to build a shelter or find food. And these surviving men will bark like mad wolves. They will devour corpses and bite their own flesh, and they will challenge God for combat. The earth will be deserted, and even God will leave. Only death and night will be on the empty earth. Then I will send a group of people, until then unknown, who with strong hands will remove the weeds from the cultivating field of vice and will lead the few faithful to the spirit of man and the battle against evil. They will found a new life on earth, purified by the death of nations. This is very grim news, but not new. We've received warnings for thousands of years about a coming change, about a great transformation in nature. Every religion has its prophecies about a death and new birth. The Bible is filled with references to a coming cataclysm brought about by fire. Every religion has stated that that transformation is necessary in order for a new earth, a new heaven to be born. And this is why we read in the book of Peter, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. We need to understand that this applies also in the macrocosm and the microcosm. Our earth, our planet, is a living entity like any other. It was born it will die. No one knows the hour. No one knows the day. There are many prophecies and many symbols, but no one knows the final moment. Nonetheless, it is undeniable that our planet is passing through a great transformation and that it is accelerating. We can see it everywhere. Much of what I read in that prophecy is already happening. We can see it. We know it. We can feel it. But this description of the end, the death, is not merely referring to the physical planet, Earth. It is also referring to our physical body, to our own Earth. We are an Earth in microcosm. We are the womb of a great spirit, a Buddha, an angel, who has not yet been developed. Our duty is to develop that to reach liberation, to awaken our consciousness. And that's only possible through a great transformation, through a great death. 
You see, any time in anywhere in nature that you want to ascend to a new level, everything of the former level has to die. When you became an adult, everything in you of a child had to die. If you want to become an angel, a master, everything in you that is impure, that does not belong in heaven, has to die. There's no exception to that. You cannot take your pride, your lust, your envy, your fear to heaven. It can't go there. It's impossible. The ego and the divine can never mix. So, for us at our level, to reach a new level, there has to be a death. We see this in nature. In simple evolution, in natural selection, when we observe the growth process of any species, in order for that species to improve, to become more resilient, to become stronger, the old parts die and new ones are born. And in each birth, there is a change. There is a transformation. With each new generation, there is a change, a transformation. But that transformation depends on death, birth, death, birth, death, birth. In this case, we, achieve, we want to achieve spiritual birth, the second birth, to be born in heaven, to have immortality. This is a law of nature. It exists. There are immortals. There have always been immortals, and there will always be. But they are not like us. They are not animals. We are animals. We're animals with intellect. But we're not human beings. A human being has destroyed the animal in himself and become truly human. For that, that animal aspect has to die. We see this anywhere in nature. When the plant gives off its seeds... Those seeds emerge, the old plant dies, the new plants rise with the changes. And that change again is propagated. The plant dies in order for the new one to rise. The seed always dies. We are a seed. We are an embryo. In Sanskrit, Tathagatagarbha, Buddha nature, the embryo of a Buddha. Buddhatta. We are an embryo. And for us to ascend to a new level, everything of our old way has to die. Everything. And only, the only things that are retained are that which belong above. Only that which belongs above can go there. This has to do with many laws in nature, specifically a law called entropy. Entropy is very complex, like cause and effect, like karma. It's very complex. What do we see as entropy? What is entropy? Entropy is a law that states that nature tends towards disorder. Simply. Simply put. But to understand that is another thing. What it means is that our physical body is a highly sophisticated order. And the word order is cosmos. This body is a world. It is a very sophisticated system or sequence that is sustained through sacrifice. Every day, we have to transform this body in order to keep it alive. That transformation, that sacrifice occurs in three levels. At the bottommost level is food and water. Obvious. We need that. Without food and water, we die. We can last a few days, more or less, without them. Food and water, right? The second level up is air. We can't live without air. For a few seconds, maybe a few minutes. And above that, impressions. 
What are impressions? Information. Perception. It's the functioning of the consciousness. That's what keeps us alive. These three aspects. These three are like the floors of a factory. That factory is us, physically, psychologically, spiritually. We are sustained. We are kept moving through a continual process of transformation in these three levels of our inner factory. We continually must eat and drink. We continually must breathe. And we must continually take in information. We all recognize that we have the longing or hunger or thirst for food and water. Unfortunately, that hunger, that thirst has become corrupted. We no longer crave the pure elements that will naturally sustain us in the most healthy way possible. Now, we want Twinkies. Right? We want to eat garbage. Many people on this planet now will not eat food unless it came out of a box. They won't eat natural food. The same with water. Many people won't even drink water. They'll only drink soda or alcohol, which are poison. There's no food in them. There's nothing nourishing in soda or alcohol. But these are the most commonly consumed liquids. There's no food in them. Chemicals, poison, that are proven to kill the body and the mind. And air, of course, we can't go without breathing. We naturally take in the breath. And our body naturally transforms these elements. Those elements are brought into us, and they are destroyed. They die. The animal dies, and we are nourished. The plant dies, and we are nourished. The grain dies. The mineral dies. The water dies. The air dies. All of these processes that happen in the body are transformations of fire. The fire of the body takes those elements, transforms them, reduces them, boils them down, obliterates them, and takes out what is needed and throws away the rest. And this is why the body excretes waste products. The lungs excrete waste gases through our exhalation. What happens on the third level of our temple, of our own earth? We don't realize that impressions are actually our greatest hunger, our greatest need. But haven't you noticed how you become very hungry to read? You become very hungry to watch television, to look at pictures, to listen to conversation, to see a friend to see nature, to see pornography. That is a hunger. It's psychological and spiritual. But unfortunately, just the same as our other forms of nourishment, our hunger for impressions has also become corrupted. Some of us, hopefully, still have the longing to be nourished by impressions of the divine. And this is why we study spirituality. Our consciousness, our burata, still has the hunger to be nourished by God. To be nourished with pure food. What in the Bible is called rachem, bread from heaven, mana. Which incidentally is that Eucharist that Melchizedek gave to us. Some of us still have that, but most people do not. Most people on this planet... They want for their nourishment through impressions to nourish their soul and psyche is violence. They want to watch the latest Hollywood movies. They want to watch all the crime shows and see all the dead bodies and the blood and the ways to kill. 
They want to play violent video games. They want to watch violent sports. They want to play violent sports. They want pornography. They want lust. Greed, envy, gluttony, fear. Most of what we take in through impressions is negative. And we hunger for that. We go on the internet to study conspiracy theories, to fill ourselves with fear, to feel that, because we love the feeling. We love the sensations that are negative. To feel afraid, to feel proud, to feel vengeful, to feel angry, to feel resentful, to feel lust. This is how corrupted our mind has become. Unfortunately, there is no instinctive automatic process to transform all that information that comes in through impressions. And thus, we have psychological constipation. This is why when we sit to meditate, when we try to see into our mind, it is a complete disaster. We cannot sit still. We cannot relax. We cannot have a moment without thoughts. Because our mind is overstuffed with garbage. Imagine if you lived in your house. How old are you now? 30, 40? And you never took out the trash ever. What would your house be like? You wouldn't be able to move. Your mind is like that. When you look into your mind, you cannot move. There's no freedom. There's no peace. There's only the stench of attachments, the stench of desires, of grasping at things that are not real. Grasping at desires. That is what our minds have become. Poisoned with all of these elements that we have sought and desire and accumulated in our minds and hold on to as if they are precious when really they are garbage. What should be happening is that as a consciousness, active, awake, aware, observant, we take in impressions, we destroy them. We extract from them what is necessary for the consciousness to grow, and we throw away the rest. This is called mindfulness, self-observation, self-remembering, to be awake. Samael and Vior called this the transformation of impressions. Through that process, the mind empties naturally. Not through force. It's natural. Those impressions come in, they leave no trace. Only wisdom. Only comprehension. Only understanding. The mind then becomes what it should be. Its natural state, which is perfectly serene, happy, joyful, and capable of reflecting the entire universe. You see, we are in nature, but nature is in us. The mind that we have, in Greek terms, or in Hebrew terms, is called heaven. When we look at our physical body, we see the heaven and the earth. The earth is the body. The heaven is the mind. But our heaven has become a hell. That's why the Bible says that the great fire will come and cleanse and burn the heavens and the earth. Now, I don't think the Christians ever really thought about that. The heavens will burn? Aren't we all going to heaven? Doesn't make sense. But it makes sense when you understand what the root word heaven means. In Hebrew, it's shamayim. The very first line of Genesis says, in English, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, from our point of view, God created us, our heavens and earth. The earth is the body, the heavens are the mind. The body, aretz, is earth. The mind, shamayim, is the heavens. That word shamayim, in Greek, is orenos or more commonly now, Uranus. That means sky, heaven. And when you study the Greek cosmology or theogony, the genesis of the Greeks, you find that it's actually the same as the Judeo-Christian. 
because it states, whichever version you read, whether from Hesiod or Aristophanes, I won't read the whole thing, it's quite long, that basically the same process occurs. From the emptiness, from the sky, from the night, from the darkness, emerged the earth, Gaia. And Gaia, from herself, produced heaven, or Enos. And they were husband and wife. Adam and Eve. Two aspects of ourselves. What's stated there in both Genesis and the Greek mysteries, and through all the different cosmologies that we can study, is that from within our earth, heaven is created. In other words, the Buddha, our inner Buddha, emerges from us. On another level, Christ is born in the manger. The Savior. The manger is our mind. So you see these levels, how the purity rises from the impurity. The lotus rises in the impure waters. In other words, hope is not lost. When this earth dies, a new earth will come. It explains in the book of Revelation what will happen. Now remember, we're not talking only about the physical earth. We're talking about our earth. This is the very end of the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When you've studied Kabbalah, this passage is explicitly clear. But without that knowledge, it just sounds like a morbid warning about the future. But in fact, these are the instructions for any of us to create a new earth, to rise to heaven. What is explained here, without going into too much detail and getting way over time, is that what is pure rises and what is impure sinks. Naturally, this does apply to our physical planet and the humanity on it. But more importantly, it applies to ourselves individually, our own inner earth. In other words, in our mind, we have what we call the ego. Or more appropriately, egos. That multiplicity of discursive desires, fears, anger, all those battling elements that seek to control us and feed themselves through us. That is all within our mind, trying to use our earth to nourish themselves. And that is the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. Those are not outside of us. They are inside. If you observe yourself sincerely, you will see your whoremongers inside. You will see your liars, your murderers, 
They are your egos, your desires, your resentments. All of those elements that Jesus called legion. Those multiple elements or defects that exist in our psyche that feed themselves on the impressions that we take in. Those urges, those desires we feel to eat and drink bad things, to smoke and thus breathe in bad things, and to take in negative impressions are because the egos are controlling us. We have to become cognizant and in control of our kingdom. We are not kings and queens of our own inner nature. We are victims of circumstances. We have to become like Melchizedek, a king, a queen. In other words, we have to become Malachim, kings of the earth, not the outside earth, our earth, our body, our mind. And in this way, we will receive help from our innermost. It's also stated in the Bible. I have a lot of quotes today. In the Psalm of David 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, right there is a passage to pause and figure out. The Lord said to my Lord is a very enigmatic phrase. Because the Jews and the Christians always say there is a single God. But this passage is saying otherwise. The Lord said to my Lord. In Hebrew it says, Jodh said to Adonai. Jodh of course, is a very deep and meaningful word in Hebrew. It is the four-letter name of God, which most people translate as Jave or Jehovah. Jod he vav he. This is the first appearance of the word Lord. The second is Adonai, which means Lord. And it says, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is the English. At the right hand in the tree of life is the right column. The column of mercy, of tob, or goodness. And the center of gravity of this column is in chesed. Chesed is the center, the core, the axis of our monad. In other words, our inner spirit, our father, our personal father. That element, our inner spirit, is an extension of his being. Jodhava. In other words, above we see Osiris Ra, the union of Osiris and Isis, and that is God, father, mother. Their son is Horus, which in Hebrew is Chesed. This is a trinity, a second trinity. So this is how we see the universal father saying to the individual father. Sit at my right hand, which is Chesed. And in that, he will make the enemies his footstool. Who are the enemies of God? Our egos. The unbelievers, the heathen, our egos. The enemies of our inner God. And what is the footstool? Malkut. Malkut, if you extend the tree of life over your body, Malkut relates with your feet. So this phrase is hiding a great transformation of how the divine in us will aid our spirit to purify his body, which is us. And it continues. Jodhava shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. In other words, our inner father, our inner spirit, our Atman, must rule amidst his enemies, which is the ego. Right now he doesn't. Who's in charge of our house? 
our temple, our kingdom. God is not. God is not the one who lets us indulge in our desires and to be afflicted with fear and gluttony and laziness. That is not God. That is Satan, our ego. And it continues, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the word of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen and shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many earths. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. That psalm is pure Kabbalah. And we could never explain it in a single lecture. There's too much. But the phrase is essentially saying, or this psalm is essentially saying, that if we remember God, if we align ourselves with our inner divine spirit, he will help us. Not only that, but his inner being will help us. Our inner father, our chesed, atman, will sit on his throne, chesed, which is related with our pineal gland, the throne in heaven, with our self-remembrance, with cognizance, with self-awareness, by listening to our conscience, which is how he talks to us. Through that, he also receives the help from Jahava. the most divine. In order for our innermost to take command of the kingdom, to put his rod of strength, which is our spinal column, and to obliterate the heathen. And it says here, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Well, that kings is not outside of us. The word kings is malachim. Like Melchizedek is a king, Melke, Melek is king. That king's Melachim is related with Tiferet, related with our human soul. And the center of the tree of life, related with our heart. It's related with the fifth degree of initiation of major mysteries. What this passage is hiding is volumes and volumes of initiatic knowledge in that one line. The day of his wrath, of course, relates with the day of judgment. But that day of judgment should be every day in us. When we take in our inner temple, the unbelievers, the whoremongers, the liars, the murderers, our egos, and we place them in judgment in the presence of our inner God. And we say, you see, God, I caught this in myself. Help me kill it. Help me die in this. And he will help us. And it says here, he shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. Those dead bodies, those heathen, are our egos. He shall wound the heads over many earths. You see, as I was explaining, we have our terrestrial earth and our physical body is a microcosm of that earth. But our egos are a microcosm of us. You see how beautiful nature is? Nature reflects itself in levels. We, when we create through our use of our energies, create in our own image. Just as the Elohim created us. But what is our image? What do we create in our minds? Do we create beauty? Do we create virtue? Are we making a better earth, a better planet, a better world? What have we created in our minds? Look in your mind and see it. What you will see there is being created in your image. The image of your consciousness at the moment you were identified is what is made. 
when you become identified with your anger, with your resentment, that energy that's processing through your body, through your lungs, through your mind, creates creates an ego. Creates karma. That element has three brains, just like you do. That element is an earth, a miniature earth created in your image, your anger, your pride, your lust. All those elements have to die. That is the apocalypse, the personal apocalypse in us. What will happen is this. Our planet is dying, trembling, unable to sustain the weight of the karma of this humanity. That's why it's happening. That death is inevitable. Therefore, we will also die. We're already dying. Not only physically. Physically, we will all die. We don't have any cognizance of that because we still pursue our desires every day and waste a lot of time on foolishness. We waste most of our lives on foolishness because we're asleep. But if we become cognizant of this fact that we will face our own apocalypse also. In other words, there will be a point at which, after these different births that we've taken, different bodies that we've taken, that the karma will be too much, and we will no longer be able to sustain manifestations in physical bodies. The karma will pull us. You see, this whole process of transformation that I described, of food and water, air and impressions, also happens in the earth. That transformation happens on the surface of the planet through the processes of nature. But it also happens underneath the planet in the processes of hell. Hell is real. We carry hell in our minds. And when there's a certain critical mass that's reached, related with entropy, there's a doorway through which we pass. We enter into devolution, to be purged by nature. This is part of nature. It's natural. When a body becomes diseased, the body fights the disease. The body becomes feverish and sends all of its elements to kill the infection. We are the infection on this planet. The planet is trying to kill the infection. The planet is shaking because the infection is killing it. That's how Melchizedek could make his prophecy. He is the planet. So, we have a choice to make. We can continue as we are, mechanically receiving impressions, food, air, water, and mechanically transforming them in accordance with our desires and creating more cause and effect, more harmful consequences for ourselves and nature. And nature will allow us to do it. And in the end, nature will take us and purify us of all of that. This is called the second death. This is a process through which the consciousness, those elements, are taken out of the physical realm and put into the inferior worlds, which in Kabbalah are called Klippoth or Gehenon, the Avicii, the infernal worlds, hell. For that consciousness to be purified, in other words, to be burned. The same way that our stomach burns food and sends the impurities into the colon. And the colon, through great pressure and heat and forces, purifies everything. You see, the earth has a colon too. It is hell. We are entering into it as a humanity. Because we are so filthy. Nature cannot get anything good out of us anymore. We're not making the sacrifice to rise up to a new level. We are just creating garbage. Not only are we filling ourselves psychologically and physically with garbage, we are filling the planet with garbage. Things that nature cannot digest, like plastic, like radioactivity, 
like the impure oceans, pollution. So nature is going to purify itself. So if we take advantage of this knowledge, we can avoid the second death by performing it in ourselves. So that day of wrath of the Lord, something we should be performing daily in our meditation to purify our minds, to watch ourselves all day and all night. And when we find impurities, to seat it on the chair of the accused and to understand it so that we won't repeat the mistake. This is a process called psychological or mystical death. It's represented by John the Baptist in the Bible, represented by Jesus, represented by Moses, by every initiate. We don't enter heaven just by believing. We enter heaven by being purged. But there's a difference. When nature purifies itself through the second death, the consciousness emerges out of that process purified, but not having grown. The consciousness, the soul, doesn't gain anything from that but pain. It ends where it began, with nothing. Just thousands of years of experiences, but no understanding, no comprehension, no wisdom. On the other hand, if we perform that cleansing consciously, we acquire the wisdom of all the mistakes that we've made. We understand, we learn what is right, what is appropriate, what is wrong, what is inappropriate. We comprehend compassion, love. We understand what anger truly is and its devastating effects. We understand why lust is wrong and harmful. We understand why envy destroys. And from that, we naturally, spontaneously become good people. In other words, we become a master, a king, a Buddha, an angel. That is what an angel is. An angel is a human being who's become clean. And there are many levels of angels through every level of the tree of life. These are hierarchies of beings. When you look into the heavens, you are seeing their bodies. Not their soul. Not their consciousness. They can take bodies like us. But all those planets, all those galaxies, all those suns and solar systems, all those worlds are all those who have done what we have not done. The universe is not empty of life. It is life. And we are not the pinnacle of civilization. We are a backwater world filled with vice. Do you have any questions? Absolutely. Everything that is outside of us is a reflection of what we are inside. In the book Revolutionary Psychology, Samael stated that our exterior circumstances reflect our interior. And we make the mistake of thinking, if I can change my exterior life, I'll be happy. But we don't realize that everything that's happening around us is because of what we are inside. The city around us was made by us. God didn't make it. And we see, if we look in our cities, they are not ideal places to live. In fact, they're quite corrupt. They are like sores or wounds on the earth. If you look at earth as a scientist from a distance and you see this beautiful planet, how radiant and lovely it is, but then you go in close and look at a city, it's horrible. It's like a boil or a bleeding wound on the earth from which is oozing pollution and garbage. Nothing good is coming out of it. Let me tell you a little secret, too. Other planets don't have cities. We do. Let me explain a little bit about that 
This is something I didn't touch today because it's a big topic. It was just more about entropy. It's very hard to put into words, but if you understand what I was saying about transformation, that to rise, for us to sustain the body and become healthy, we have to eat good food, and that food has to die. If it's bad food, it will kill us. We know that. If you eat cardboard, you will die. But if you eat fruits and vegetables and things that are good for you, your body will nourish and grow and get healthy, like especially as a child. If you eat all garbage when you're a kid, you're going to be sick your whole life and weak. If you eat really good food, your body will grow in a very healthy way. The same is true spiritually, and the same is true on the planet. Entropy means nature tends towards disorder unless superior forces act and raise that system up. So it means that if you take um, a vessel of boiling water and a vessel of cold water and you combine them, just mix them up, they will equalize each other, right? They will average out into nothingness. They won't have any distinction, no order amongst them. They will just flatten out. The same is true if you take salt and flour. If you take salt and flour and mix them, and you just shake that a little bit, they will mix up. They won't separate themselves naturally. They will mix and become equalized. That's what happens with a desert. That's what happened with the moon. All of those elements were being mixed. All the psychological and energetic and spiritual elements were being mixed, but without superior forces applied. So everything became equalized. Everything died. The example of the salt and flour, if you mix them consciously with intelligence, you can make bread. Right? If you apply heat, if you add water. If you add elements and pre produce a transformation, you can make something good. But if you don't do it intelligently, you'll make nothing, something inedible. But the same is true in nature as a whole. What this means is that humanity as a whole is not living intelligently. Without consciousness, we are completely asleep, ruled by desires who only want to feed themselves. In other words, there is no superior sacrifice being made. There are no virtues being cultivated. We're not eating good. We're not thinking good. We're not acting good. So as a result, the entire society is in decline. Cities are in decline. Countries are in decline. What is the end result? A desert. Complete disorder. Order has to be created consciously, cognizantly, through the sacrifice of superior elements in order to nourish a good growth. From where is a golden age going to come on this planet? Who on this planet is living with humility, with chastity, with compassion, with peace? We're not. Not as individuals or as countries. You cannot create peace with nuclear bombs. You cannot create peace by waging war. You cannot create wealth through theft and through lying to people and mis misleading them the way all our big companies do. You cannot create equanimity and health through garbage. Let's be sincere and investigate not only our society, but our mind, because that's where everything comes from, us. This society exists because of how we are as a mind, as individuals. If we as individuals allow ourselves to waste so much time and energy on garbage, to buy things we don't need, to do things we don't need, to spend our time on things that are harmful for ourselves and others, how can we expect society to be any different? We just go along with the flow of society which is to indulge in negativity. We laugh at virtue. When someone is honest, we mock them. Right? And when someone is sincere, when someone does a good thing, we laugh. And when they're sarcastic and cruel, we like it. If you don't believe me, watch TV. Watch your coworkers. Look at it. You'll see it just below the surface. We indulge in negativity. And when anything positive happens, we feel guilt 
and we don't want to be associated with it. Because our friends are all celebrating negativity and we want to be accepted. We want to be a part of our community. The end result is entropy. Disorder. The cities that we live in are not getting easier to live in. They're getting more complicated. Year after year after year. That's because the order that sustains health and peace is in decline. It is order that produces a civilization, not disorder. It's harder to travel. It's harder to live. It's harder to make a living. It's harder to eat. And this is not just in one place. It's on the entire planet. You can't escape it. And it's getting worse. So let's throw out all these foolish, utopian lies about a golden age that will come out of nowhere. It won't come. We have to create it. But it's going to come through death. Firstly, through our own psychological death. Now, Kizadek pointed out something that Revelation points out and that all the scriptures point out. There will be a new earth. There will be a new age, a new race, a golden age. But it will not come out of this filthy humanity. You can't take your lust there. You can't take your computer, your car. You can't take the internet. I'm sorry. I know you love it. There will be no internet in the golden age. It will be a totally different civilization on a totally different level. And the only way to gain entrance into it is to have your ego dying. Over the next few hundred years, this earth will pass through a tremendous revolution. Samuel Anvior gave many lectures and wrote many books explaining all of the aspects of this. It's very complicated. It's the planet. It's nature. It's very complicated. There are a lot of things that are happening and that will happen. And they're not pleasant. Nonetheless, the, the divine is very wise and compassionate. And those who deserve it, who earn it, will be sustained. We can earn that place. We can earn the right to go onwards to help humanity, to help reduce suffering, and to help bring in a better age for humanity. But we have to earn that. It is not given for free. It is given when you deserve it, when you're purifying yourself. When God in you says, Yes, you, my child, are doing it. Then you can earn that. Any other questions? Uh, how can we make a serious commitment to the Gnostic teachings and get help from our being to keep that commitment? How can we make a commitment to get help from the Gnostic teachings and our being? The best way to get help is to work on yourself every day. That's it. And that work is not exterior. It is interior. It is psychological. It is spiritual. It is, quite simply, to learn the three factors that produce a revolution. The first one is death. Psychological death. To be constantly watching your mind, your actions, to learn about your three brains, to learn about your psychology in detail, not by reading books, not by listening to opinions, but by watching yourself. By every time you feel like you see yourself, to get out of that self and look at it. It's a constant revision of what you think, what you feel, what you see. The minute you think, oh, now I get it, don't make that mistake. The self is a very rich, profound volume. It is deep. Anytime you think you see something, you're only seeing one piece, and the mind has many levels. This is why we have to meditate. You can't see it all with your physical eyes. Physically. You have to meditate. And secondly, we have to learn birth, which is how to create the soul, how to nourish the consciousness. 
And that is to do this transformation consciously in all three levels of our inner factory. It is to take all the elements that we can that are good and useful and nourishing in order to sustain our soul. To stop eating garbage, not only physically but psychologically. We know there are things that we do we should not do, so stop. There's no more time. We don't have lifetimes anymore. Humanity moves in waves, like every other creature in nature. In waves. This humanity, this wave of humanity, is cresting. We have a limited window of opportunity for all these conscious elements to enter in physical bodies and reach their goal. And if they don't, the wave is absorbed back in the ocean. Our wave is being absorbed. We're out of time. Don't assume you're going to have another body. You probably won't. I know in my case, I do not. That's why I'm so zealous. I know from my own personal experience, out of my body, this is it. If I don't do it now, I'm going into the second death. No, there's no way for me to negotiate that anymore. So I can tell you from my own experience, this is just absolutely true. And I know it. Some people have asked me, how come you're so zealous like a preacher? That's why. Because <laughs> I know. Don't assume you have time. You don't. You don't even know how long you've got in this body. Right? Does anyone here know when they're going to die? I don't. So make the best use of every day. Die in yourself. Work on your ego. Be born in yourself. Cultivate good behaviors. Cultivate your inner spirit. Feed your consciousness with good things. Study the scriptures. Study yourself. Study nature. Nature is a great teacher. And third, sacrifice. Help other people. Don't live your whole life just feeding your desires. All the great masters don't do anything for themselves. They do everything for others. This is what we have to learn. This is what creates a golden age. When we serve sincerely and honestly to give to others, this is the greatest joy. It isn't just a stale hallmark phrase that giving is better than receiving. It is a fact. Giving is better. We're focused on receiving. We always want to get and get and get. Everything we do, we're always thinking, what am I going to get out of it? That's ego. Learn to become conscious. What can I give? What can I do? How can I contribute? That is what the spirit in us wants. Those three factors of what put us in a position to receive help. Not only from our inner God, but from other masters, from other angels, from other beings who are here to help us. We are not alone here. I know the news in this lecture and the prophecies are very painful to hear. I feel that pain. When I read about the coming cataclysms and I watch the news and I see the earthquakes and tsunamis and I see the starvation and poverty and all the suffering on this planet, it hurts. But remember, we're not alone. Remember your Divine Mother. Remember your inner being continually. They will help you. And you can get help from the Gnostic Church which is not in a physical place, it is also inside. To appeal for help to the Gnostic Church doesn't require you belong to one school or another or follow one teacher or another. It is to earn it in yourself, spiritually and psychologically. You can be completely alone out in the forest or the desert and enter the Gnostic Church. You don't have to come here or go to some other place. It's not to do with anything physical. It's psychological. And the Gnostic Church is not just Christian. There are Buddhist Gnostic Churches. There are uh, Muslim Gnostic Churches. Jewish. All over the world. Trying to help us. Moreover, and what is probably most surprising to most of us, is that there are a lot of people from other planets trying to help us. We don't want their help. We keep shooting missiles at them. But they are trying to help, and they will help you if you ask for help. So the most serious important thing is 
work daily in these three factors, birth, death, and sacrifice. Don't let a day go by. Each day is a mirror of your life. Each day reflects the entirety of your life. If you spend your whole day in foolishness, you're spending your whole life that way. Do what you can to spend some time every day working on yourself. And gradually work to increase that, and you will get a lot of benefit. Another question back there? Any questions? Yes? Where do you read about the practice for Saturday the 13th? Uh, as far as I know, it's not written. We're going to do it. Yeah, uh, students here will do that practice today, the practice of Melchizedek. It's quite simple. On the 13th hour of the 13th, on any Saturday, any Saturday the 13th at the 13th hour, lie down in the shape of a star with your arms and legs out, close your eyes, and pray to Melchizedek and meditate. Simply that. You can add and take from that what you will. That's the basic idea of the practice. The idea is to call upon the help of Melchizedek to learn about yourself. Don't, don't call upon Melchizedek and ask him to help you get a new car right, or to get a new house because people do that. That's not the point of the practice. The point of the practice is to get help from Melchizedek to learn about your own earth and to learn about your relationship with his earth, this planet, and to change. Is there a question here? The apocalypse, it's gonna way. it will happen. Right. It's a good question. Well, again, there are, there are different levels. There's the macrocosm and the microcosm. This planet Earth will pass through an apocalypse no matter what. It's unavoidable. In fact, it's necessary. It was already decided it's going to happen. And the reason is, God won't let humanity get worse. God's not going to let humanity spread this infection anywhere else in the universe, which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to build rockets to take our infection to other planets, to do like we did with Cortez and um, Pizarro and all those other guys who went to other countries and spread their infection and killed millions of people through their insanity. We want to do the same thing now with other planets, and that won't happen. So the Armageddon, the end of this planet is going to happen. Nobody knows when, but we're approaching it. The thing that is still at play is our personal apocalypse. Will we go along mechanically with humanity and pass through that with them and just be a victim of the circumstances and be recycled by nature? Yeah, if we don't work on ourselves. But if we work seriously and produce the Armageddon in ourselves psychologically, in other words, all of the impure elements in us die, then we will be extracted from this physical apocalypse. There will be a group, all of those human beings on this planet who have earned the right will be taken out. That's what happened with uh, Noah's Ark, remember? Noah's Ark is the story of Atlantis. Atlantis passed through an Armageddon, just like we are. The Selenites on the moon passed through an Armageddon, just like we are. And in every case, those who earn the right to be taken away are taken. Noah's Ark represents that. Noah took his sons, his spiritual sons, his disciples. And they went into the Ark, the Arcanum, the secret teachings, and they were taken out. At that time in Atlantis, those were ships, cosmic ships not boats. The Atlanteans had a much more developed civilization than we do. We're way more degenerated than they were. So in the same way, there will be a group taken from this planet when the time comes. I doubt it will be with our technology because we're not even close. The Atlanteans, Noah, who's actually... Um, oh, the name's escaping me now. 
Manu Vaisvata. Yeah, Ramu. He stole Atlantean ships to take his people out. I don't think we'll be able to do that here. I don't think the Earthlings will develop ships capable of escaping it in time. I could be wrong. I really don't know. It may be that uh, other humanities will take the select few out. We'll see. Nonetheless, we have to understand that difference. The physical apocalypse on this planet is going to happen. Whether we pass through it is up to us. Is there a question in the back? You can learn more about that whole process, about the apocalypse and the selection of souls, in uh, The Aquarian Message by Samuel Envior, in The Doomed Aryan Race by Samuel Envior, and also in lectures called The Great Selection of Souls, which are on Gnostic Radio. And they fully explain. Also the lecture at the end of the Kali Yuga. It's another very good lecture. And it explains all the details about this, so you'll be fully informed about it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.